A gal is opposed to raising the age of consent from 14 to 16. Whether or not we think Canadian teenagers should be having sex at age 14 or 15, the reality is that most Canadian teens of that age are indeed having sex. Some of them are having consensual sex with their same age peers, and some of them are having consensual sex with adults. A gal believes very strongly that it is possible, even common, for 14 and 15 year olds to consent to sex, even with people over the age of 20. Canada, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to murder your name. Uh, That's okay, me. I could just introduce myself and <laughs> spare you. Please do, you're, and you're along with uh, Mr. Gregory Cole. Yes. All right, please uh, uh, tell us who you are and then present. Sure. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kai Hasselreis, and I'm the Executive Director of EGAL Canada. EGAL Canada is the national organization that advances equality and justice for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans-identified people and their families all across Canada. EGAL was established over 20 years ago, and we have thousands of members across this country. Everywhere in Calgary Northeast, Scarborough Rouge River, Oshelaga, Windsor, Tecumseh, Notre Dame de Grasse Lachine, and, uh, and everywhere else. Uh, one of our members is actually with me today. This is Gregory Coe, a University of Ottawa student who will be attending McGill Law School this fall. We're very pleased to present a gal's views to this committee, so thanks very much for inviting us. As you know, <clears throat> homosexuality was illegal in Canada until the late 1960s. So whenever the gay and lesbian community hears about a change in the country's sex laws, you'll have to excuse us, but we tend to get a little nervous. A gal sees Bill C-22 as an unnecessary invasion into the sex lives of young Canadians. 
There are already sturdy laws that protect teenagers from sexual exploitation and assault. Instead of further criminalizing sexual behavior, Canadian governments at all levels should instead focus on sex education. We should help young people by helping them make their own choices about what is comfortable for them. EGAL is opposed to raising the age of consent from 14 to 16. Whether or not we think Canadian teenagers should be having sex at age 14 or 15, the reality is that most Canadian teens of that age are indeed having sex. Some of them are having consensual sex with their same age peers, and some of them are having consensual sex with adults. A gal believes very strongly that it is possible, even common, for 14 and 15 year olds to consent to sex, even with people over the age of 20. And when young people don't consent to sex, Canada has very strong laws in place to protect them. Laws against sexual assault at any age. Laws against people in positions of authority who take advantage of the minors in their care. We also have strong laws against child prostitution, child pornography, and internet luring. We should teach young people to make decisions for themselves. We want young people to get reliable information about sex from their school, from their guidance counselors, local health clinics, and peer support groups. We want young people to get sex information from friends they can trust and also grown-ups they can trust. If young people feel that their behavior is criminal, we have good reason to believe they will not seek help. Likewise, if school boards get the impression that youth sexuality is being criminalized, they'll be apprehensive about offering full sex education before students turn 16. And after 16, it could be too late, because that's when many young people drop out. We should also give discretion to the courts about the relationships that young people get involved in. We want judges and juries to focus on individual cases and make decisions about the best interests of young people in those cases. We do not want to leave it up to the government to make broad judgments about all young people in Canada and the activities they engage in. Finally, I would like to talk, like Andrea Cohen did, about anal sex. I mentioned earlier that homosexuality was illegal until the late 1960s. That's when section 159 of the criminal code was changed to allow consenting adults to engage in anal sex. But section 159 was not eliminated then, as it should have been. It still exists in the criminal code, and if you take a look at the criminal code, you'll see that it exists between the sections on bestiality and incest. The criminal code makes anal sex illegal for anyone under the age of 18. That means, as Andrea pointed out, that all 16 and 17 year olds who engage in anal sex are committing a crime. Even if they do it with a 19 year old or an 18 year old, or even with another 16 or 17 year old. Bill C-22 does nothing to abolish this inequality, even though Section 159 of the Criminal Code has been declared unconstitutional by several different provincial courts. It's time to eliminate Section 159, and Bill C-22, if you insist on passing it, is the perfect opportunity to do so. At the absolute minimum, the age of consent for anal sex should be equal to the age of consent for other forms of sexual expression. If not, Canada's anal sex laws will continue to be an act of state-sanctioned discrimination. In conclusion, and before Gregory says a few words, let me say that the issue of young people and sexuality is indeed a very sensitive one, and it's one that should be carefully considered before any laws are passed, and that's why I'm very glad that we have this opportunity today to make our presentation to this committee. Wiedigal would like to thank the Justice Committee for the opportunity to speak about this very important topic. So thanks for listening. Here's Gregory Coe. Thank Please. you. Uh, Mr. Cole, before you start, uh, keep in mind uh, that I'm going to hold you to your time, as I have with uh, the other presenters, Sounds due to the numbers that we have here. I'll try to keep it brief. And uh, actually, I'm quite happy to address you as a current student at the University of Ottawa, not Ottawa University. And unfortunately, I didn't have uh, the chance to fill up that questionnaire of, of yours there. Um, mais en tout cas, uh, en tant que jeune Canadien associé au travail de Égal Canada, il me, il me paraît...
As a young Canadian associated with the work of Egad Canada, it feels absolutely appropriate for me to give you a youth perspective on this matter which will have an effect on uh, Canadian youth. First off, I'd like to stress two points. First off, I believe that this committee's intent for the bill is to protect young Canadians against sexual predators. I have no doubts as to your good intentions. However, I should point out that strong provisions already exist within the criminal code to protect people under 18 from internet leering, sexual assault, and relations with someone in a position of trust or authority. So <clears throat> we are calling to question the need for this change. Unfortunately, the idea of raising the age of consent from 14 to 16 will certainly be interpreted by young people as a criminalization of their sexual relations. Although there are nuances within this bill allowing for sexual relations between young people, the message that this bill is going to send out will effectively be to tell young people under 16 that their sexual activity is illegal. A silencing effect on youth. I think we need to be worried about young people who are going to be too afraid to come forth, to seek health advice, to be counselled. If our true intention is to safeguard the sexual lives of young Canadians, then our focus should be on sexual health education and not on the criminal code, to ensure that young people can make intelligent and informed decisions about a very important part of their lives. Sex health education is about keeping an open line of communication for all youth, particularly for those who, in reality, let's face it, uh, begin to experiment at the age of 14. It is about ensuring that the most vulnerable among us are the most informed about their rights and about their safety. Raising the age of consent to 16 will make keeping those open lines of communication all the more harder and might mean that the most vulnerable among us go uninformed. And second, I believe that if we want to discuss the issue of sexual relations among youth, it has to include all young people, heterosexuals and homosexuals. That means that we should first off start by repealing section 159 of the criminal code which sets 18 as the age of consent for anal sex. Under the current code, even relations in, between two young 17 year old gay uh, people would essentially be a criminal offense. This is not only um, blatantly unfair and homophobic, but it was also declared un unconstitutional by the Courts of Appeal in Quebec and on Ontario practically a decade ago. If Canada wants to consider itself a fair a country, it should uh, provide legislation in a fair manner. Thank you all. Some of those recommendations including th included things that the government could change now. For instance, the differential age of consent when it comes to anal sex versus uh, vaginal sex. Yeah. Uh, is that something that the government... Would be yeah, that's something that we're, uh, we're very much looking forward to, uh, to moving, uh, moving on uh, in, in short order. Mm -hmm. And the final point concerns to the legislation with a view to ending historical discrimination. So two corrective efforts. Section 156 proposed by Bill C-75 and the expungement mechanism in Bill C-66 already passed uh, rely unjustly and discriminatorily on today's age of sexual consent. First, proposed Section 156 preserves the possibility of prosecution for wrongful conduct where the offenses once in place have been repealed so long as the conduct remains criminal today. And second, Section 25C of Bill C-66 provides for applications for expungement orders for convictions in respect of listed same-sex offenses on certain conditions, including that the persons participating in the activity were 16 years of age or older at the time. Now, both provisions aim to end the harmful effects of criminalizing same-sex conduct in a discriminatory way while preserving the power to punish conduct that remains plainly criminal by today's standards. But both are problematic. Efforts to assure equal treatment must not rely, as these do, on the current age of consent of 16. Instead, it is necessary to take into account the fact that while the age of consent for sodomy was for time 21 and then 18, the age of consent to different sex, sex, was 14 until the year 2008. 
proposed Section 156 would still allow the prosecution for consensual sodomy committed with a 14 or 15 year old because today someone that age cannot consent to sex except with a person close in age to them. The expungement provision for its part would not permit the expungement of a sodomy conviction for consensual sodomy carried out with a 14 or 15 year old. Whatever the good intentions, these provisions unintentionally perpetuate discrimination against our communities insofar as there is no basis for prosecuting a heterosexual who had consensual vaginal intercourse with a 14 or 15 year old while the age of consent was 14. Accordingly, Justice Canada's charter statement is incorrect when it states that the enactment of proposed section 156 would limit any such prosecutions to those that do not raise charter concerns. Thanks for your attention. concerns intersex children. Subsection 268.1 of the Criminal Code sets out the crime of aggravated assault and its subsection 3 addresses excision. It specifies that wounds or maims include cutting a person's labia majora, labia minora or clitoris. But then it provides an exception where surgery is performed for the purpose of the person having normal reproductive functions or normal sexual appearance or function. And the alternative basis for the exemption from aggravated assaults application is when a person is at least 18 years of age. In other words, paragraph 268.3a deflects the protections of the criminal law from children on whom surgery is inflicted for the purpose of giving them a normal sexual appearance or function. And the idea of the normal sexual appearance or function is a vehicle for cis-normative assumptions about which bodies are medically correct or normal. I can't undertake a full charter analysis this afternoon, but section 268.3 raises concerns about security of the person and equality. Moreover, international human rights bodies have recognized the so-called corrective surgery of children whose genitals are characterized as abnormal violates their personal autonomy and integrity. So we urge you to amend Bill C-75 to modify 268-3. Thank you. On behalf of EGAL Canada, I would like to thank the Chair and the members of the Committee for the opportunity to speak today on this fundamental issue of human rights and public health. In 2017, EGAL's Just Society Committee published a report reviewing Canada's criminal justice system and identifying provisions of the criminal code that have a discriminatory effect on LGBTQ2SI Canadians and are therefore in need of reform. That report identified Canada's criminalization of HIV non-disclosure as a key area for change. Consistent with the report's recommendations, EGAL fully endorses the Canadian Coalition to Reform HIV Criminalization's Community Consensus Statement. In particular, EGAL's position emphasizes that, first, any use of the criminal law should be limited to actual and intentional transmission of HIV. Second, in keeping with the expert consensus statement on the science of HIV in the context of criminal law, in no circumstances should the criminal law be used against people living with HIV who use a condom, practice oral sex, or have condomless sex with a low or undetectable viral load for not disclosing their status to a sexual partner. Third, the offense of sexual assault must not be applied to HIV non-disclosure in the context of sex between otherwise consenting adults, as it constitutes a stigmatizing misuse of this offense. Reforms must ensure that they do not further stigmatize people living with HIV or undermine protections against sexual violence. EGAL's position is informed by the reality that criminalization of HIV non-disclosure discriminates. 
It disproportionately affects already marginalized populations and contributes to their marginalization. To begin, the criminalization of HIV nondisclosure cannot be separated from the discriminatory stigma that attaches to HIV. It is important to recall the historical context. Homophobia marked the response to HIV from the outset, when the first cases of the illness were reported in 1981. And at first, it was labeled as gay-related immune deficiency, GRID. Further, criminalization of HIV nondisclosure continues to have a disproportionately harmful impact on marginalized people, including members of the LGBTQ2SI community. Troublingly, some of these inequalities have only gotten worse since the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in Mabior. As set out in HIV Criminalization in Canada Key Trends and Patterns, which was included in the material submitted to the committee by the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network, black men are overrepresented in the prosecution of HIV nondisclosure, especially since the, since the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in Mabior. They are also significantly overrepresented in media coverage, contributing to intersectional stigma and prejudice. Nearly half of the women charged with this offense are Indigenous. Criminalization of HIV nondisclosure also continues to cause particular harm to gay men, bisexual men, and other men who have sex with men. According to the Public Health Agency of Canada's 2017 surveillance report on HIV in Canada, the gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men exposure category continue to represent almost half of all reported HIV cases in adults, at 46.4%. As such, the threat of criminal prosecution disproportionately affects the lives of gay men, bisexual men, and other men who have sex with men. As noted in the Key Trends and Patterns document, men who slept with men represented 25% of all men charged from 1989 to 2016. And post Mabior, the numbers increased significantly to 38%. Finally, to date, considerations of the impact of criminalization of HIV nondisclosure on members of the trans community in Canada has been woefully inadequate. However, there are strong indications that such criminalization harms trans women in particular. The Public Health Agency of Canada's 2012 population-specific HIV AIDS status report on women noted that it found no Canada-specific data on HIV prevalence among trans women but that a meta-analysis estimated a particularly high HIV prevalence rate of 27.7% among trans women in North America. Further, the academic research on the experiences of trans women who have sex with men has found that their experiences of violence, transphobia and stigma, depressive sym symptoms, substance use, unstable housing and extreme poverty contributes to HIV-related sexual risk behavior. And these factors often cluster together. EGAL echoes concerns about the failure of HIV policies to take into account the lived experiences and perspectives of the trans community that have been raised by community activist Nora butler Burker, Professor Zach Marshall, and Professor Vivian Namaste, the research chair in HIV AIDS and sexual health at Concordia University. In short, people who are already marginalized faced a disproportionate risk of contracting HIV. Risk factors for HIV are often interrelated circumstances of marginalization. For example, members of the LGBTQ2SI community include injection drug users and sex workers. Criminalization of these already marginalized communities only adds to their social exclusion, fueling stigma, and frustrating public health initiatives. The LGBTQ2SI community knows all too well the harm of being criminalized based on existing grounds of social exclusion. As such, the criminalization of non-disclosure of HIV status is an issue of critical concern to the LGBTQ2SI population. EGAL is encouraged by the directive to the Federal Prosecution Service and recognizes that it is a step in the right direction. However, more needs to be done. In terms of its content, the Federal Directive does not fully reflect the principles in the Community Consensus Statement. For example, it calls for prosecutorial judgment regarding the types of activities triggering criminal liability and the use of sexual assault offenses. Further, because it is drafted, drafted as guidance to prosecutors, it does not set clear standards for what constitutes criminal conduct. Most significantly, the federal directive, which applies only in three territories, does little to meaningfully curb prosecutions. 
Although the federal directive is a positive step forward, legislative action is required to ensure clear and uniform application of the criminal law across the country, to constrain the application of the criminal law to cases of actual and intentional transmission of HIV, and to build upon and make durable the federal directive's positive step forward. Finally, while it is EGAL's position that amendments to the criminal code are necessary, it is also essential that these be carefully considered and developed in consultation with people living with HIV, medical experts, legal experts, and community stakeholders. The much needed amendments must be crafted to avoid perpetuating stigma towards people living with HIV and continuing to thwart public health initiatives. In terms of immediate action, while a legislative solution is developed, EGAL calls upon the federal government to actively encourage the provinces to adopt similar directives or directives more consistent with the community consensus statement. Thank you. Second, very briefly, I just wanted to signal that we fully endorse the report from Kinsman and all that you're about to hear from. We support their calls for Bill C-75 to go further than it does in a number of ways. And we affirm their call for adopting clear evidence-based guidelines on the use of criminal law in prosecuting cases of HIV non-disclosure. At this stage, it is evident that better regulation of online platforms is needed, but we cannot simply transpose old ideas onto this new forum. Requiring content monitoring by online platforms may be appropriate. However, there is a need to balance making platforms responsible for content from, from which they profit and the risk of incentivizing sweeping censorship. Creative solutions should also be explored to prevent online platforms from using algorithms that magnify and direct users toward ever more hateful and extreme content. Additionally, more can be done through public education and information campaigns. To, to strengthen online media literacy, to ensure a better understanding of what amounts to hate and harassment, since inflammatory and wrong understandings fuel distrust of initiatives to promote tolerance and inclusion, and to ensure broad public knowledge of the historically devastating effects of hate. Finally, in any government response, hateful speech directed towards members of the LGBTQ2SI community must not be treated less seriously than speech directed towards other groups. EGAL Canada therefore calls upon the federal government to take a broad approach to developing a robust toolkit to combat online hate and harassment. Thank you. Bad news for the worst people on the internet. Yes, you can be sued for defamation when you baselessly call LGBTQ folks and drag performers groomers. That's according to a new court decision. And my pal Luke over at Press Progress says right-wing trolls are freaking out. Here's what's going on. The completely false and deeply harmful trope that members of the LGBTQ community are coming for your children is nothing new. It was false in the 1970s when it was used under the tagline, Save Our Children. And it's false now when the anti-LGBTQ hate account lives of TikTok also uses it. The court said evidence confirms the term groomer is a slur, one that is used to quote, allege that drag performers sexualize children and aim to recruit them into the 2SLGBTQI community. And the court found that quote, perpetuating such stereotypes and myths about members of the 2SLGBTQI community is not public interest speech. And that yelling this slur at people isn't protected under anti-slap laws, which are designed to protect people against lawsuits that aim to silence critics by burying them in legal costs. So if you think you can go around and just holler at LGBTQ folks that they're so-called groomers, don't expect your public interest free speech to protect you. It won't. Not only that, but a court now recognizes this slur is based on, quote, hurtful and hateful myths and stereotypes. In a press release they sent to me, the director of Egal Canada said this is an important decision, especially given the, quote, undeniable rise in anti-2SLGBTQI and anti-trans hate fueled by the spread of misinformation and disinformation. So, uh, should I? What do you think of all this? A gal is opposed to raising the age of consent from 14 to 16. Whether or not we think Canadian teenagers should be having sex at age 14 or 15, the reality is that most Canadian teens of that age are indeed having sex. Some of them are having consensual sex with their same age peers, and some of them are having consensual sex with adults. A gal believes very strongly that it is possible, even common, for 14 and 15 year olds to consent to sex, even with people over the age of 20.